Hey Theologian, I just wanted to point out real quick before we get going here that this video is currently playing on my main channel, Bible Unbound. However, this video really lives. It exists on my second channel, Theology Unbound. So that's why it's a little different. If you like this video and you want to see more content like this, I would encourage you to go and subscribe to Theology Unbound and turn notifications on. That's because I won't always be posting the Theology Unbound videos over here on Bible Unbound. Until then, let's explore. Imagine a world not so very different from our own, but with one key difference. There is a man who could unite us all together. Talk to I, I don't agree with him on a great many subjects. There are a few that we do agree on, um, but uh, he certainly is the best in the world at what he does. And um, Mr. Billy Graham. It's very nice to be with you, Woody, and I'd like to say that there's some things I don't agree with you on. Not just Americans, either but Russia and Ukraine, China and Taiwan, Baptist and Presbyterian, Orthodox, Catholics, an emissary of a kingdom greater than our own. A man who passionately proclaimed the gospel, building thousands of churches, and thus inadvertently creating the culture of Christianity that you live in today. Would you follow him blind? Or would you want to know what he truly believed? This man was Billy Graham. This is his story. The broad swath of this video is based on Graham's autobiography, Just As I Am, which is linked in the description. However, to situate his theological views, I have somewhat meagerly consulted the library of content he wrote, books like Peace with God. While this video is therefore by no means comprehensive, I do think it'll provide valuable insight into the man, the myth, the legend, Mr. Billy Graham. You see, Billy Graham has rightfully come to represent much of American Protestantism because he, he really embodies the product of Americana and Christianity. Graham was born in 1918. World War I had just ended, and his early memories will involve his family's nearly uncanny fortune through the Great Depression. Graham was baptized three different times throughout his life. Once as a baby, once volitionally as an adult, and then finally, once when he made the decision to join the Southern Baptist Convention or SBC. Graham's parents were nominally Presbyterian until the famous American evangelist Mordecai Ham preached through their town. Then his parents became committed Presbyterians. And like any good Presbyterian, Graham was skeptical of the Methodist-style holiness movement that had recently come to a close in American history. But as fate would have it, Graham himself would be converted to Christianity at a local Mordecai Ham rally in his own hometown, just like his parents. He would also soon come to reject their Presbyterian traditions. It was at this time in his life when Graham decided that he wanted to commit himself to studying the Bible. He had aspirations to become a preacher, and so to put himself through school with the help of a family allowance, Graham spent his summers selling hairbrushes. Near the end of his life, Graham would credit his ability to sell those hairbrushes as his ability to sell Christ to crowds of thousands. Though headed for the pulpit, after a charismatic encounter on a golf course one night, Billy Graham became fully convinced that he was called to become an evangelist first and foremost. And so nearly overnight, Billy Graham realized that he was called not to a church, but to the church. Billy Graham was a promising, if not prodigious, Bible student at the Bible Institute of Tampa. He caught the eyes and ears of many who would listen and was often invited by local churches to preach, though he had not yet gone to seminary. It was at this time when Graham was introduced to other expressions of Christianity. And so here in Florida, Graham threw off his Presbyterian roots and became an official member 
of the SBC. What was so fascinating to me about this, by the way, was by sheer coincidence, if not providence, Billy Graham, like some sort of embodied version of the Second Great Awakening, threw off his Calvinist roots to embrace the Arminian tradition and fervently share the gospel. He was invited by the Southern Baptist Convention to attend seminary. Having his school of choice, Graham decided to attend Wheaton College in Illinois in 1941. Here, Billy Graham met perhaps the most key and influential people of his entire life. For one, it was here where Billy Graham met his future wife, Ruth Bell, the daughter of two missionaries. And Graham also met Tory Johnson here, the founder and president of Youth for Christ. But then suddenly, the Second World War broke out. Graham, ever the patriot, decided that he wanted to enlist as a chaplain for the war. However, the government would not let him join until he had finished seminary. Billy Graham graduated seminary in 1943, two years before the end of the war. However, he was severely underweight, and by the time he could bulk up, the end of the war seemed imminent. So Billy Graham pastored a church for about a year, even though his real passion still lay in evangelism. When Tory Johnson approached him about heading up a division of Youth for Christ, Billy Graham jumped on it, and everything changed. This position at Youth for Christ included a radio talk show. Perhaps in one of the most quintessential evangelical moves, Billy Graham decided to take daily news clippings and use them as a catalyst for discussing biblical, theological, and gospel-centered points for his radio show, which became immensely popular very fast. Graham also became deeply interested in current events and political policies. Well, the bomb had dropped in Japan, veterans were coming home to a developing world, and everyone was hungry for meaning, for purpose, a revitalized sense of what it means to be an American. And Graham himself comments about how all of these reasons and others were vital in his growing popularity. And popular he was. This Youth for Christ radio show sparked his national fame as an evangelist. He developed a film company around this time, Worldwide Pictures, that also spread his name and the name of Christ far and wide. So he decided to take a team and travel across the country, coast to coast, sharing the gospel of Jesus Christ, imploring people to take a side for Christ. And he called these events Crusades. At one such crusade in Tennessee, Billy Graham looked out over the crowd and saw a rope dividing the audience straight down the middle by race. While he encountered this type of behavior before and had heard stories about it while at Wheaton College, this was his first awakening to the realities of segregation in the United States. The story goes that in the middle of his sermon, he jumped down from the stage and began to tear down the rope, causing one usher to quit on the spot in a fit of rage. However, these meetings of a couple hundred would pale in comparison to his most famous U.S. crusade, Los Angeles. With no press marketing or print advertising, Billy Graham launched a crusade in the heart of LA. And when people began to show up, they simply did not stop. By the end of the six week long revival, nearly 350,000 people had come to attend and an estimated 3,000 people became Christians. Billy Graham's fame spread around the world. His company decided that a European tour was on the horizon. Europe was memorable for Graham and his team because of its relative animosity toward religion after the fallout of World War II. However, in the heart of London in 1954, Graham estimated that two million people showed up in attendance. He spent the next several months traveling across Europe. When he returned home, he did not stop. He kept preaching, he kept sharing the gospel, and he kept selling Christ to passerbys. Billy Graham was like a circuit rider who had an airplane at his disposal. His constant state of motion, working, and ministry weighed heavily on his spiritual, emotional, and family life. Billy Graham was becoming burnt out. 
At the end of his life, he would acknowledge that he may have never actually recovered from such a stressful ministry. He believed his family may have suffered greatly from his absence, though his children have never acknowledged such a thing publicly, or to him. Each of his children had their own journeys, he says, and their own experiences. Regardless, Graham felt ashamed, and he missed much of their lives on the road. By the time the 1960s had rolled around, Billy Graham had gained international notoriety. He was close friends with Martin Luther King Jr., and he preached passionately on the healing of racial tensions from the pulpit, though he never marched publicly. Through a series of mutual connections, Billy and Ruth Graham then became close friends with John and Jackie Kennedy. Graham's use of political news during his radio show grew within him a massive political interest. In the 60s, brought about a time where Graham exercised his Christian influence throughout the White House. Though even to the day of his death, Billy Graham acknowledged that each president merely leveraged his image for a religious flavor to gain the presidency, Graham nonetheless always took his political connections as a method of sharing, if not converting, presidents to the message and kingdom of Jesus Christ. He claims to have never spoken about politics or personal political views to any of the presidents. Graham would go on to become the chaplain for every president from Kennedy to Barack Obama, transcending political and denominational affiliations. By the time Donald Trump took office, Graham had developed severe terminal cancer, and Billy Graham died on February 21st, 2018, 100 years after he was born. His political influence did not stop at the United States, even though it's most obvious to us. He met the political leader of virtually every country that was formed while he was alive, including China and North Korea. He led evangelism meetings in almost every country that he visited, drawing crowds that sometimes could not even be numbered. He somehow rose above his religious and political differences with other people all over the world. He even drew massive crowds in Orthodox Russia at the time when the Wall of Berlin was still up. And so it's really no surprise that Billy Graham came to represent something in the American mind. He came to preach in unwavering hope that was built upon the just kingdom of God. Though Billy Graham never regarded himself as a prophet, he most certainly was. Regardless of the political or religious leader, Billy Graham was insistent that justice be wrought to the oppressed and new life be given to the spiritually dead. So much so that he even came to popularize the term born again. Like the prophet Daniel, Graham saw himself as an emissary of only one kingdom, God's kingdom. And he brought that message to the Babylonian kings of his day and never relented in standing firm until his death. By the end of his life, Graham lamented the time he spent traveling and wished he could have spent more time studying the Bible to understand God and his word. He felt he had only gained some sort of elementary grasp on theology, which may have been true. Though he never seemed to waver from his Anabaptist traditions of the SBC, he pressed the point of making a decision for Christ so firmly, he may have inadvertently created a culture of American Christianity called decision theology, or decisional regeneration. This line of thinking is pretty consistent with the Anabaptist tradition, who stressed adult baptism, where an individual needed to make a volitional decision to receive the salvation of Jesus Christ. Now, this may sound insane, but some Christian traditions don't believe that at all. But more, whether consciously or unconsciously, Graham's crusades were almost step for step based on Charles Finney's new measures, which are questionable, if not outright manipulation, in order to firmly move people into the Christian religion. As Graham saw himself, he was, after all, salesman for Christ. You know, it's not lost on me. And I hope it's not a caricature to say that Billy Graham was deeply interested in politics. Now, we live in a culture where Christianity is often synonymous with a political view. 
It's not lost on me that while Billy Graham was passionate about the gospel, he was, by his own admission, unlearned in a lot of theology and theological history. And now we live in a Christian culture where knowing theology is often looked down upon. It's not lost on me that Billy Graham was invested in making a personal decision for Jesus Christ, and not many people have stopped to ask what that means exactly. But there is a story from Billy Graham's autobiography that, that really stands out to me. It was sometime during the high point of his speaking ministry, and Graham was approached by a few members of his team. They wanted him to, along with everything else he was doing, restart his radio broadcast. He was already burnt out and exhausted, and so he declined, but they insisted. And so he made a stipulation that he thought was so ridiculous it could never happen. If they collected $25,000 from the offering that night to start the radio show back up, he would do it. That night, a mere five people donated, each with a note. The donations totaled $24,000. And when Graham got back to his hotel room, there was a check waiting for him for $1,000 from a man who could not reach him after the show. Each note mentioned they wanted their funds to go towards starting a radio broadcast. None of the men had ever met each other. None of the men had ever met Billy Graham. They had just felt the Holy Spirit move in and through them to bring about this gospel-centered radio program. You see, even though Graham's theology has influenced our current culture of Christianity in ways incalculable, God still moved in and through his ministry to bring millions of people to himself and worship him in truth. God works through history providentially. How smart we are, how gifted we are, what we've learned, or how we learn it is of little importance to God, for he will be the one glorified at the end of all eternity. Does that mean that we should reject opportunities to learn more about God? Well, no, absolutely not, but I just wanted to be clear. Amazingly, this has striking parallels to the book of Daniel, a book about national justice, which Graham was deeply interested in. The prophet, Daniel, says that nations are just, they're going to topple, and God's kingdom is inevitably going to be established. The leaders of nations are like pawns in the hand of an almighty chess player, God, who is working all things together for good, regardless of who's involved. That is very good news. Thanks so much. We'll see you next time. Hey, Austin here. Just a quick reminder about Bible Unbound and the content you just watched, which was supported by our funders over on Patreon.com. Patreon is where you try to get a bunch of people to donate small amounts to fund a mission. And the mission of Bible Unbound is to discover the Bible by uncovering the gospel. You see, we are passionate about creating a community of people who want to see Bible-curious people understand the Bible by seeing the gospel and Jesus proclaimed throughout the entire thing. And so if you want to fund that mission, if you want to become a part of the vision we have over here at Bible Unbound, you can explore more of that over on patreon.com. We'd love to see you there. Thanks so much.